Hi everyone and welcome to chapter six. In this chapter, it is all about texturing, my favorite part. Um, and I wanna talk about a few key elements actually, um, you know, things that I think about as I'm working, um, things that I've learned through the process. And you know, that's the really fun thing about Substance Painter is that every time I'm in here, I'm learning new things. And when I'm not inside of Substance Painter, I'm watching tutorials from other artists and learning new things so that I can bring those into my own personal workflows and pipelines. So let's go ahead and dive right in and start talking about our metals and what I was thinking about for those. I did lean towards the cooler uh, side of the color palette, or, um, or I should say the cooler side of these neutral colors. And I wanted to have an accent color. I knew that from the get go. And based on some of the pieces that I had for reference, I decided that I wanted to go with an orange accent and just have this really, really nice pop of color uh, from these neutral neutral colors, right? And I think that was really, really an awesome touch to have in here because if I didn't, then it would be just kind of boring, uh, a little bit more along the lines of a stormtrooper as far as it just being a black and white metal. And I, I really wanted to try to have something that would, would punch and then ultimately tie that into my final renders later on. And I think the orange works really, really well. Um, and actually I'm gonna talk a bit about these decals in a few minutes, cause I learned some new things and I'm really, really happy with the technique of using projections. But before I get into that, let's talk a little bit more about these base materials. Now I have a bare metal that I've created and that bare metal is at the very, very bottom of my stack here, just above just this base layer, which is to make sure that I don't end up with any, um, pure white or, or null value really. This is just kind of the uh, a clamp here uh, in, a, in a sense. It's gonna catch anything that I might've missed um, that was really minor and um, that's why I have that here. Sometimes I'll switch it to red just to see if there is anything that I missed, um, but that's why that this is here. And uh, a, the bare metal um, is great, but I didn't want it to be everywhere because that's just not very realistic. I wanted it to be on just a few pieces. So I have it here and I have it here um, in this inner piece here. Uh, and of course, if I so chose and I scratched away the primer layer, then I would have that bare metal show up as well. But it also just adds some uh, extra little details to the surface uh, that are usually pretty micro in, in most cases, little, little irregularities in the surface, and I keep those in my bare metal. So the primer layer is pretty straightforward. I ultimately wanted to go with a darker value for the primer so that it would pop uh, when um, when exposed uh, with the, uh, the white metal here, right? So it's just like this nice contrast between the white and now this darker primer and so that I it will, will pop, it'll be more noticeable. And then that way, when I have edges like this that I want to you know highlight here in a different way, then it's, it's more noticeable than it would be if it was just bare metal, right? Um, and because of the value of the primer, it's also in this um, color range that it, will, it shows up in the black metal too. So I have just the same primer throughout all the metal pieces, uh, all the painted metal pieces. So it's really, really nice to be able to just paint away black metal or white metal and then see that, that primer under there. So it's just the same primer um, applied. It's really neat. And the reason I do that is because, well, in reality, when we're scratching painted surfaces, typically we're not gonna see just bare metal underneath. There is a primer layer. Now in previous assets that I've created, uh, I will, will sometimes you know go that gamey route where we exaggerate and we want to show the bare metal scratch because it's shiny and that's cool. Um, and I'll actually have techniques in which the, the primer is, is uh, hugging the edge of the exposed paint. So you're just seeing little bits of pieces of the primer. You're not seeing it more um, intact like in this version. Um, but for, for this, I wanted to go a little bit more towards realism. And I was like, well, realistically, again, if I wanted to see bare metal on this, I'd have to scratch the hell out of it almost intentionally, right? Uh, or something would have to have 
regular interaction here to show me that bare metal underneath. And so I chose to just have that primer, but mostly, mostly because I wanted to have the contrast between the white and this dark primer because it's just going to show up better than bare metal. So that was really the intention beyond it. Um, so let's move up our layer here and we start talking about the painted metal and the white metal. Now for the white metal, right off the bat, I knew based on a bunch of the reference I was looking at that I wanted to go for the sci-fi white metal that's you know really really glossy and shiny and just looks really really nice right and then we get these which which you know in turn means that we get these really nice contrast and roughness breakup between like dirt and scratches and all these other fun little bits um, so that's why i chose this particular white but i knew right away that the black paint i needed to make different and i didn't want to go shinier so I went with a um, more matte look to the black paint to add this nice material breakup. So yes, they're both metal, but they're different roughness values. And that's important because it just helps add uh, more visual interest to our asset here. And if I switch to the roughness channel so that we can visualize the roughness, you can see just how complex uh, these materials are and the, all the layering that is occurring um, between all the layering of the dirt and the grime and all these little scratches and just everything that's layering and layering and layering adding all this visual interest I even have uh, based on some feedback I got from from friends and colleagues to add in uh, you know shinier kind of oily stains to the black metal to help it pop more um, just in you know different highlighted areas so that when the light catches one of those sections, we can see it just like a little smudge of oil or something that's collected on the black metal. It just makes it pop in different spots. But getting this material breakup is just really important for making our assets look realistic um, and believable. And more importantly, just visually complex and fun to look at. So moving right along, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm not really going to talk about the wires or the rubber foot because those are pretty straightforward. There's nothing particularly fancy about them. Um, you know, we can see here that yes, there is a roughness breakup in, in, in those materials between that and the rest of our services. And, and they, they suffice in the job. But I'm going to circle to the decals because I thought that that was something that was particularly interesting that I learned from this process and that I hadn't tried before. But right from the beginning, I knew that I was gonna add these stripes and I didn't know where they were gonna be necessarily or how I was gonna go about it uh, entirely, but I knew that I wanted to try to leverage projections. Uh, and so if we come here and we look at our decals. Let's see, am I in the right one? No, let's go to the the head. Because I want to talk about this particular stripe set here. So we're going to switch to paint and metal. And we're going to come down here to paint layer and decals. So if I zoom out, you can see that there is this volume here, right? And that is the projection. And I have the shape crop set to cropped to the shape. Um, and so what that means is it's not gonna extend beyond this volume. This volume is controlling where the stripe is occurring, right? And it's really, really cool because if I want to iterate, which is a huge part of game development, I can easily nudge this around and start getting different results. Now, of course, it's got to load because recording is sluggish. It's slowing this all down. Um, but you can see here, it's really easy to just nudge this around and start seeing different results for where our strike placements could be, right? And this is really, really cool because, you know, like I was saying, iteration is a huge part of game development and nothing is really ever done until it's shipped. And then even then it may not be entirely done. 
but um, at some point you just have to save pencils down, right? And this gives us the flexibility though to come back in and make changes. So if an art director comes in and says, no, 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 I don't want the stripe here. I want the stripe over here. You can do that very easily, then go back in and paint your edge damage, or you know you could even set it up so that the edge damage is procedural. I went with a hand method for the stripes here in which I use stencils to paint away and scratch up the, the uh, decals here. But there's ways that you can make it more procedural, and I, I just, you know, it's a fine balance. Um, you know, when I, I'm painting grunge, when I'm painting scratches and wear and tear, it's a balance between procedural and hand um, painted methods. Um, I prefer hand painted because it's more purposeful and thoughtful behind it, but procedural methods help me get to a point, and then I start subtracting away. It's a, it's a very common practice that I do. I just feel like I end up getting a more organic approach to edge damage and stuff by allowing uh, the procedural things to um, kind of lay down a foundation and then I can come in and start painting away. I just kind of turn my brain off and start uh, painting away the edge damage and then getting some different interesting results um, from, from, those, uh, from that workflow, right? So back to the stripes, uh, one thing that I thought was particularly clever when I was experimenting was that I realized I could add a roughness right here. I was able to add a channel here that just impacts the roughness. And that was really, really cool to uh, experiment with and learn so that I could control the base roughness here for the decal and then control another roughness value for the pattern that I have tiling in here. And this is really neat because anywhere the decal is used, you know, including the triangles and the text and, you know, the resolution is a little bit low right now. So that's why it looks a little fuzzy uh, and that's just to speed up while I'm recording. But be able to get that, uh, that pattern tiling in just where the decals um, show up is really, really neat and cool that it just adds this nice extra little bit of visual interest to them uh, at certain lighting conditions, right? Um, and that was a lot of fun. And here's one of the main reasons why I wanted to use this method. Look at our UVs here. This would be a huge pain to try to get to line up inside of Photoshop. I mean, extremely painful because of the nature of the way that the UVs are laid out and the surface not being boxy. Uh, we couldn't get particularly straight results in our UVs. We, we just wouldn't be able to do that um, effectively. And so because of the projection method, it's laid down these perfect lines for our UVs. I mean, this is great. So, you know, we have the power of iteration, we have the power of it being fast because we don't have to now line up things. And so I was able to really just play around with the stripe design. You know, at one point I had a stripe down here in the middle, I was like, no, I don't like that. So I, I shifted it over here and I like this asymmetry that it adds. It kind of complements the rest of the, the asymmetry we have going on here with the cameras. It's just really nice, and I feel like it ended up um, doing a good job of kind of balancing the whole feel of the droid. And that pop of orange is just really, really nice against that white metal. So yeah, um, decals are fun. If I was gonna do this method again, I would of course use this for applying decals and maybe stickers and things like that. Uh, for these here, I um, these you know, triangles and these stripes and stuff down here. I actually just used a stencil method with, um, believe it or not, mirroring. It was the first time I used mirroring uh, for applying the stencils. Super powerful, really awesome, um, because I didn't wanna have to apply a sticker here and then shift over and apply a sticker here. So being able to use that mirror uh, or symmetry method inside of Sussence Painter was really cool um, and allowed me to quickly apply these stencils and move on to other fun parts of the droid. So let's see, what else? Let's move along and talk about grunge and dirt and what I'm, what I'm thinking about when I'm applying grunge. So for grunge, uh, one of the things that I actually take into consideration is complementary colors. 
So obviously I knew that my droid was more on the neutral side um, and a little bit on the cooler side of things. So I decided to go with a slightly warmer dirt for the droid. And it's even really more apparent, I would say, on the black uh, metal here. So we look at the painted black metal, we can see this warmer value or warmer uh, hue that we have for the dirt. And I feel like that is a really nice complement to the whole droid. It's a little less apparent on the much cooler white metal um, in some ways, just because I didn't go as heavy handed as I did for the legs, because I'm also thinking about how the grunge is being applied to the droid, like in context, what is this, where is this droid, you know, running around, functioning, how are things being damaged on it, how are, how is grunge and dirt collecting on it? Uh, and so I have a little bit of a thicker application of the grunge on the legs because I'm thinking, you know, it's running around, dirt and dust are collecting, dirt and dust are collecting on the bottom because it's scraping against, you know, maybe uh, vegetation, rocks, dirt, all those things are being kicked up and, and hit the, the bottom. So we have a lot of scratches uh, on the bottom decal here and, and less on the, the head because it's not going to be getting as uh, scratched up as the, the bottom would. And then we have some fun accents where we've deliberately said we want, uh, or I want a scratch here because something has hit the face of this, this droid, uh, or I'm trying to move the eye around because of little bits of detail. So I've created detail here and then your eye can move here, you know, so I'm, I'm constantly having areas of rest and areas of detail and I'm applying that, uh, because, or I'm applying that based on areas where this damage will also occur. So it's, it's deliberately thought out. Of, of where I want it. And then of course I'm adding damage to the edges because I want to, you know, just highlight those edges, bring more interest there so that it's even more apparent that there is an edge, that there's a, an angle shift, you know, those sort of things, right? Um, now, of course, where is grime and grunge gonna collect the most on this droid? Well, I'm thinking it crevices, you know, panel lines, and, the, and that's twofold because the grunge also helps it be, it helps make it more apparent that there's panel lines here, right? Uh, and the grunge is, and dust is collecting on the top because this is a, you know, relatively easier surface up here for dust and dirt to collect uh, than it is for the side here. Because of the shape of our droid, it's less likely that dirt would just be splashed and stick on this particular side of the droid. It's gonna collect in areas that are more logical, right? So the top, um, you know, flat surfaces, those areas are gonna be able to see more grunge collect easier than it would be for this, the simple side here. So let's talk about the grunge a bit, and I can actually dive into the body here. And we're gonna talk about specifically grunge on the legs and kind of a method that I like to use. And I should take a moment to say that, you know, if you're looking to learn more about texturing, you should really check out stuff from Hannah Watts and Jay Cummings. Both are really amazing artists and I personally, I love to learn. And so learning new stuff from them and their texturing thoughts was really, really fun. And uh, I definitely encourage everyone to continue to learn and improve upon their own personal pipelines and workflows. So let's go ahead and look at the grunge here for the legs. I'm gonna go ahead and pan up. Where's our dirt and grunge? Yes, here's our master dirt and grunge. So if we come down here to grunge bottom, should probably name this bottom grunge, but <laughs> uh, I'm using a position here, right? I'm using a position. So if I turn on the mask and I drop down some of these settings, this is really, really fun to play with because if you have say like a, a crate that you know is gonna be 
sitting out in an open environment and it's collecting lots of mud and, and, and dirt and dust are collecting in different areas, you can use a lot of cool filters and procedural methods and generators to get really awesome results quickly. Now, I'm a huge fan of using position, especially for dirt that's building up from the ground up because it gives me this nice gradient. And that's really important. It helps ground assets. And I mean, it just really adds um, to everything blending together in a scene. And so for this particular instance, I have the droid here and I know that grunge and dirt are collecting at the feet and then they're gonna slowly build up and then fade off. Now, if I want to change this mask, I can simply play with the global balance here, right? So I can make it stronger or, or weaker. Um, and then I can also shift the position on it. So I can say, I want the position to be higher. So, you know, maybe he's running through, the, this droid runs through much thicker uh, mud and vegetation. And so it's kicking up away more dirt and grime. And now we have this, well, it's probably more apparent actually in the mask, but you can see we have this nice gradient that goes further up. But if we wanted it to be tighter, maybe, you know, maybe he's running around an area that's rocky. And so there's actually less uh, grime buildup. We can simply come back down here to our position and we can change the balance and so we make it tighter. So it's like, yeah, he's getting some dirt and grime build up here, but because the surface of this planet is so rocky or wherever he is, the biome is so rocky, he's not getting as much of uh, this loose dirt and, and mud and stuff like that collecting and so it's tighter, right? Um, the same thing, if maybe he's an inside mostly and so you know we might wanna dial it even more or just make the overall opacity less. Um, it's really, really a cool technique. And of course, in combination with using fills, um, such as, you know, AO for masking and things like that, we can really start to quickly add grunge to areas, um, and, uh, exclude other areas that we don't want. Right. So if we have, for example, this kind of dust right here in which it's, uh, the dust is meant to collect on the uh, top portion here, right? It's meant to, to be dust that's being, uh, it's floating around and it's falling and it's settling on the tops of surfaces. Now, the, this light method is really cool. I actually picked it up from uh, watching Jay Cummings texturing and light is really awesome. However, the problem with this particular filter uh, or uh, generator is that it doesn't take into account all the geometry that's overlapping. So if I turn off my AO mask, you can see that the, the light, which is directly above our asset, is cutting through all, I mean, so any top surface is getting it, which isn't exactly what we want. You know, this area here is being somewhat occluded. And so what I did was I tossed in a, um, a fill with our AO map, or say we, my AO map, <laughs> uh, and set this to multiply so that I can start to occlude it. So I make it less, um, less, less apparent, right? Like I want some build up there, but not a whole lot because it is occluded. And, and that way, the areas that are really um, exposed to the elements are getting more of this dust settling from above. And it's less on the areas that are being occluded. And in fact, in some cases, it's going to, because of our AO map, it'll fully uh, occlude those areas. And so it'll mask out and they won't receive uh, the dust at all, which is also what we want. You know, for areas like this interior here, um, you know, I don't really want that to get a whole lot of settling dust at all, if any, because it is just completely encased almost, right? So it's really, really fun what you can start to do and ex with um, just these different maps and generators and you can start to experiment and get these more realistic, believable smart materials uh, set up so that you can constantly use these in future projects so that you can just quickly get to 
um, texturing the asset, get it in game, and then fine tuning that final result as quickly as possible without having to constantly recreate everything from scratch. I mean, and when I create smart materials, I'll continue to build upon them. If you watch video two of this chapter, the time lapse version, I actually start with a smart material I created a while back uh, for a glass bottle. And I took that as a base to start with, and then I started tweaking it. So now I have a new smart material that I can leverage. And the same thing with my, my grunge and stuff that I've created here. Um, I'm just going to continue to iterate and rebuild upon these based on things that I've learned from other artists uh, or from just me experimenting with this new asset, right? So I'm constantly updating my smart materials, throwing out old ones, and just continuing to build a, a really massive library that I can leverage so that the next time I want to create a robot, uh, it'll be much faster to texture uh, having these already created, right? Okay, so that's going to do it for this chapter. We're going to be moving into rigging and animating next. Uh, so thanks for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next one.